this presentation. It's um, about it's split a bit in two parts. So uh, first part is more about uh, integration platform. The second part it's about okay when you're doing um, custom code using cloud solutions. What are some um, let's say services or tools which uh, could help you uh, in uh, in solving solving all those integration challenges. Um, if you want to ask questions, please put, the, please put them in the chat. I will try to answer them or raise your hand uh, and um, to, to, to get my attention. I won't go into uh, a lot of details in, uh, in these parts, but uh, there will probably be more detailed presentation about each part. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming you are seeing the uh, shared screen, so I will. Um, yes, yes. I will continue with a short poll. And um, while while doing this, um, if you scan that uh, QR code about what technology stacks or integration platforms do you uh, know of, just for uh, for my curiosity. And uh, the next thing would be to uh, talk what is integration. So the shortest definition, I, I would say, is to have systems that can talk to each, or, each other. I think it's hard today to build an app which is not, or, or a product, uh, which is just sitting there, not uh, being uh, connecting to anything else. So most of uh, our products and apps uh, which we're building are now uh, trying to use as much as possible existing uh, functionalities and only add your uh, let's say your flavor on top or your what makes you different for your product and um, integration i would say can be inside the organization so you have a lot of products uh, or uh, systems in the, your um, organization. So a big organization might need an um, integration between all of those, or it can be in uh, your product and um, or between the organization and third party systems. And uh, okay, about the types of integrations. Um, I didn't put a poll here, but um, yeah, how many uh, integration types do, do you think there are? If, um, sorry, the chat got into, uh, into my um, screen. So types of integrations, um, you can quickly define three of them. So point to point integration, like a star integration, uh, hub and spoke integration, that's also called um, or horizontal integration or a vertical integration. So uh, each company or product could say, well, and have a strategy, okay, we think we need um, one of these type of integrations for our product. Okay, and let's say you are now building an app. Let's take a, a simple scenario right now. You're, you're building an app and um, you want, let's say to add a nice feature for your users uh, that they can uh, maybe see um, the um, account statements from their bank in your app and uh, join that with multiple banks. So the first thing that uh, you you do, you have on your roadmap, connect to that, uh, that the bank API. That's the first integration that you will have. You're connecting to that bank or multiple banks and uh, you have that now then you also get another requirement maybe to connect to um, for example a service which is uh, giving you the latest um, um, uh, forex um, quotes and you get that for a nice service in the cloud and you're connecting to that one and then uh, you have another feature for the administrators of your app, which are really would like to have an ERP connected to your app to, to be able to have uh, more information about the users and uh, also 
now the sales would like to have your app connected to to salesforce so that they can um, also uh, identify a bit leads based on uh, what your uh, uh, appli application is doing and what, about the, what the, your users are doing so at this point we're in a point-to-point -point integration scenario where uh, the application knows to talk with each of these systems and uh, yeah you you need to know each of these systems you need to implement uh, uh, um, let's say a service or um, to use an sdk for each of these systems to, to to talk to them and yeah this is let's say a pretty uh well, let's say obvious scenario where you would do these kind of things but at at one point maybe you need to have another app and um, things get a bit more complicated in a point-to-point -point integration and having another app might be just because you decided hey i want to have a microservice architecture or uh, because you have another app in your organization and uh, they have a, uh, a lot of the same requirements which you have but uh, maybe uh, one is from hr and another one is from accounting and um, uh, both of them need to talk to all these um, external application and also between each other so while also uh, an, another scenario found a lot this is uh, um, making things a bit more complicated and for organizations which have maybe hundreds of apps connecting each of them and having separate teams which are reinventing the wheel and by saying that is trying each of them to connect to all those systems might get costly so in that scenarios um, uh, they might choose something else and but still for a point-to-point -point, uh, integration there are also some advantages right so it's nice and easy to implement at first it's easy to uh, to start something to have a product uh, and of course it's an obvious choice when there are few integrations needed and, um, and this can be also maintained that uh, uh, easily by the product team there are some disadvantages also it also requires maintenance and maintenance and changes so you need to have teams which are always proficient in different languages because those apps might be in different languages and to know each application how is it connected it's not that easy uh, the scalable and um, yeah the information is a bit silent so what will somebody choose uh, or what could you choose in uh, if you are working into in an organization like that or you are tasked to doing that on, on a huge amount of integrations well if we're looking at the current um, or the, yeah, the current situation we're in instead of a point-to-point -point integration we could uh, switch to a hub and spoke integration and um, this concept was um, uh, used by the integration platforms and uh, originally they were called uh, ESBs uh, enterprise service buses I think now they're not called like that anymore their name is not that uh, sexy anymore uh, it uh, looks too uh, in the past too old so they most of them they rebranding themselves so there are a lot of integration platforms like Mulesoft, uh, which has now some kind of an any point platform which is the, the integration platform it's only a, a, a small part of it like or like uh, microsoft bstock or sap cloud integration platform and of course a lot of others which are trying to do the same thing uh, offer um, a platform which based on that enterprise integration patterns um, book which i highly recommend to to look into it uh, they are offering you platforms which have components that you can drag and drop and uh, the type of integration which this platform try uh, are are solving uh, is the messaging uh, integration so um, 
those platforms handle messages. It's uh, the probably the first um, um, version of uh, event-driven uh, architectures. <laughs> and um, what this, um, um, let's say, patterns are for messaging, and I also recommend to buy this book or uh, read it from a library, rent it, whatever. These kind of concepts, I think, they will be used in any kind of project uh, which uh, you are uh, you are doing. So, if it's a project which you're doing, if you're doing custom code or if you're doing, uh, if you're using an integration platform, these patterns are the ones which will help you understand. Hey, what should I do with with my message? And also, what are some uh, architectures or non-functional uh, requirements which the, the platform should be solving and those integration platforms basically uh, this uh, are doing this all the things that which you see here they are generally offering you in a ui where you can mostly drag and drop so they are low code platforms where you could uh, solve some business scenarios almost without any code uh, if you know these patterns, you know how to, let's say, create an endpoint, uh, drag, drag and drop, what kind of channel, what to do with the message which is received on that endpoint, how to transform it, and how to return it on a different kind of uh, uh, endpoint. Um, the advantages of these platforms, and I will go into a bit more uh, examples later but the uh, i want to also uh, uh, um, discuss a bit that about the advantages and disadvantages so in general they are low code platforms they do have a lot of components so uh, i was mentioning salesforce you probably will have a connector for salesforce in all of them so you don't even need to know how salesforce is uh, working what are their um, let's say authorization uh, requirements and so on they you will be able only to configure those and um, one of the things which i let's say like when i would uh, when i need to use an integration platform is that they do have monitoring uh, capabilities and dashboarding so if something goes wrong you could see exactly where you are what happened uh, what was the message uh, which was received, uh, what was the error, where did it fail in a, in a flow. <laughs> and yes, as I said, they offer virtual tools for fast implementations. Um, now, the disadvantages, I think they are not for small integrations. And I'm saying that because in general, they are priced for enterprise level companies. So, you know, if you go to each of these platforms on their website you will not have a price uh, you need to ask for a price so in general when you see that probably it's a lot or for a startup it might be a lot for an enterprise might be peanuts compared to the uh, level of uh, investment which uh, would be needed for um, code it yourself and of course as you saw, being in the central point of your platform, it would be, or the product, it would be a single point of failure. I put as a disadvantage also the dedicated team and experience. So while you don't need multiple teams for multiple languages, you do need a dedicated team for, for this platform. So once it's in, yeah, it will, it will stay there a lot. And I have a small comparison between, uh, uh, let's say, code it yourself and using an integration platform. When you, let's say, uh, have a very, let's say, small product, right? So at the beginning, maybe you receive a proof of concept requirement for, hey, I want to copy all invoices from a department to another department. So accounting uh, needs all the invoices which were, uh, um, um build to to customers and in an let's say maybe uh naive implementation 
we could assume that we are in an organization, we have access to local drives, so it's a local network, shared drives can be copied also on another, another shared drive, so it could be something like this, right? You have an uh, API call or an event, calls a service, reads those invoices based on some configuration and move them to, or copies them, sorry, to a different uh, location. If we would write code, for example, in Python, that would be really, really fast, right? That this code will basically do exactly uh, what that, prob uh, that um, uh, problem says. If you would choose an integration platform, and um, as a disclaimer, I choose the MuleSoft, and that's just because it was the easiest to obtain access to um, quickly do a demo. So you can download it, uh, we, uh, uh, the designer locally, and uh, quickly design some integration flows. Here, uh, the all, all the Let's see, does it work? Yeah. So these are all components and you, you drag and drop them. So you drag a listener, you drag, drag uh, a, a component, which it says, yeah, copy files and uh, configure it with an input and an output. So also pretty simple. You define what should be uh, happening in case of uh, error ha um, handling, so how to handle errors and you deploy this flow of course you deploy this flow <laughs> on premise or in in the cloud and um, yeah that's uh, why the, the the cost of this uh, platform is uh, in general higher they are providing you with um, and this software as a service for deploying your uh, your integration flows but now getting back to the problem definition you get new requirements. So let's say some invoices or are on an FTP server, but you need to save them to an S3 location. You need to um, save a report of everything that you copied. And also you need to put the positive and uh, negative invoices in different locations. Well, a bit more complicated scenario, not that, hard also to implement in code, right? So uh, on a diagram on what would you do, it's if you have uh, now a service which can read and write, but uh, and has an adapter for an FTP, for a stream. Of course, you need libraries for those. I'm assuming you won't write your own. So you will have uh, libraries and configuration for all of those. You will need to process the files and uh, yeah, here the process files uh, part will need to have either some library or custom code which can parse PDF. So this basically will be the most um, let's say advanced part of your applications and uh, separate them and decide where to write them. So the positive ones, well, I want to put them in Salesforce. The negative ones, uh, a different CRM, they need to be, we need to do some reverse building on those. We need to do a report here. And um, yeah, already there are at least four uh, integrations which you need to handle in your code. And uh, here for Salesforce, you need to know how their API works using SDK. For a, a, C a CRM, I uh, didn't mention any, so maybe it's a custom one. They need to give you their API and you need to code against it. For S3, again, probably you will use a library and for an FTP, uh, again, a library. Still, you will need to know how they work, how to handle errors for all of them. And um, <laughs> also, what, what happens if it's an S SFTP? Does the library know? Do you need to provide some certificates? Do you do it in the code? For an integration platform, Again, it uh, would be the same in most of the platforms uh, which I use. So uh, SAP uh, CPI has also, also the same components. You That implementation could look like this. You have an, uh, an, an API. You use now one of the 
enterprise integration patterns, which uh, I discussed a bit uh, earlier. So if you scan through them, okay, you can maybe find one which uh, look uh, looks more appropriate for your scenario. So <laughs> this one, it's also checking in, in, in uh, two places on SFTP and uh, on S3. As you see, this and these are two components. So when you click them, you can only configure them. Uh, you don't need to code them. And um, the next step, that would be here, right? So the next step after uh, get, uh, getting the files uh, would be my custom code. So that's a component where I can write my custom code. In MuleSoft, it's groovy, but I didn't use it from quite some time, but uh, looking uh, at it, it has uh, the, the possibility to supply um, a scripting engine. So I'm assuming you could put um, also a TypeScript, a TypeScript engine or uh, Python or something. So here you will write your code. So although this is uh, low code, it gives you the possibility to uh, also write your own code. You could build your whole logic in a block like that, but then you would have need an integration platform so this is your code which composes uh which parses the pdfs and you have another component which is a choice and if it's greater than zero in the choice you have a salesforce uh, connector for creating an object there and if not we don't know what the crm is but we have um api call to um <laughs> An external API. Also, what should happen in uh, error handling can be configured here. So, even for prototyping, I would say in this scenario, it's it can be pretty fast to to do this kind of integration. Your uh, if you have this and you agree with it uh, with the product owner or. Uh, the business it's uh, pretty fast to prototype something and uh, have it working without that much uh let's say or with low code and focus maybe on the business this is this this would be the the, the business uh part okay i did not uh, and by the way if you're uh, will check that uh, link this is what a uh, scatter getter is uh, is supposed to be doing. So again, uh, I'm recommending you to to read that uh, enterprise integration pattern uh, uh, website. In the programming example, I did not write the Python code for that, but it gets more complex. So you need to know design patterns. So already. Uh, it's a choice between a uh, low code or a more maybe experienced developer. And you need to have information about each system, how to configure connections, and uh, nice parts like uh, handle retries and uh, exception handling. And um, of course, in production, how to log and monitor that. Okay. <laughs> Another poll, because uh, I'm uh, at uh, the end of the first part of the presentation about the integration platforms. As I said, I will not go into details about them, uh, but maybe if you uh, check this poll, what would you choose for, um, for, um, for these? Okay, well, in my opinion, uh, I, what I would choose is uh, always, it uh, depends, as uh, my previous uh, colleague said, uh, <laughs> that would be the correct answer, uh, because it also depends on the organization. So uh, 
for example, for uh, SAP, CPI, I will probably uh, choose it only when the organization or the project which is done uses also different uh, SAP products. They are taught to work well together and uh, yeah, that's when you are uh, getting the most out of your, uh, of your money. For uh, MuleSoft or uh, BStock, again, depends. For BStock, if you have a Microsoft um, uh, based stack, that would be uh, probably a the, the way to go and uh, for uh, let's say for for uh, java uh, for a java stack or uh, for uh, people who they're they're not in a sub or uh, in a microsoft uh, domain you could also choose music and um, uh, when to choose it maybe when uh, you see that on the list of uh, of uh, requirements on the roadmap there are a lot of integrations a lot of um, uh, data to be moved around between systems and uh, maybe have heavy data uh, loads and, and so on i see that nobody is using or in the poll who an uh, integration platform right now <laughs> okay now going to the second part uh, of my presentation and also related to integration challenges but um, that would be when doing let's see, cloud development and uh, when you have your custom code and you're using cloud services and in that scenario um, you have some um, uh, again, tough decisions to do. So, where, what will be your custom code? Would you use uh, uh, services? Would you uh, deploy them as uh, one app or uh, microservices? Would you use uh, lambdas or uh, let's say serverless? And if you're doing cloud, probably you will choose also some cloud services unless you want to be cloud agnostic that that also comes with a cost uh, if you want to um, uh, do everything yourself so there are some uh, architectural patterns which you first need to decide and also um, yeah uh, if you're doing a monolith a microservice or nano services and uh, that those would be those uh, uh, simple functions which uh, are very very specific but they are also being that specific somebody or they need to know how to interact with each other and uh, in this situation you need to decide also on on two uh, patterns so would you do orchestration or would you do choreography in your inner project and uh, as you also see the difference is uh, is will somebody this tell everybody what to do or every participant will uh, decide based on something happening and um, yeah on the choreography part those are the event driven architecture mostly um, where um, each component reacts on uh, on events in a, in a simple example uh, for choreography for creating an order for example uh, the order service says okay i created an order here you go i have an event for that let me know if i can uh, if i can continue uh, then another another service needs to decide well do i have enough credit or uh, uh, or i don't have it so it will emit another event with credit reserve or credit uh, exit and uh, <laughs> the order service needs to subscribe and listen to those kind of events so it can decide okay the order was uh, successful or uh, it was a failure so that's a choreography each service decides based on uh, what it got or on an event what what to do so nobody's uh, telling them or uh, um, 
they are reacting based on uh, uh, what are each of them are doing and anything. In the case of an orchestrator, that's the one which decides what to do. So it says, hey, uh, I want to call the order service. I want to create a saga. Uh, by the way, the saga, <laughs> I did not um, mention it here. It's a sequence of local transactions. So if you have multiple services, um, you do not have you, you have distributed transactions you cannot have a two-phase commit so you need to handle that situation and um, uh, the mess each service will need to publish a message or trigger something uh, to the next transaction in uh, in the saga and uh, there uh, the, the saga needs to provide also some compensation transactions so when something fails or does not work according to plan, uh, it can undo the previous transactions. So that's, that's the hard part, uh, the compensation part, it's hard when, when you're doing event based. But uh, also here in the orchestration part, the saga says, I want to reserve a service. It still emits an event, so it's still messaging. Uh, it, uh, the, the customer service gets that event, says, well, I did it or I couldn't do it. And based on that, it's either uh, create the order or or fail the order. So the job of the orchestrator here is to uh, make sure that the order it's um, completed and all the steps are being uh, uh, done in a specific order. <laughs> but in case the, that you are writing a lot, so you have a lot of services and you decide that you have functions. I'm uh, really curious if you if you used any of these services or if you tried to use uh, uh, Lambdas or Azure fun uh, functions. Well, they are very specific and uh, they are resolving a very, let's say, um, specific uh, task. And when they start to grow, it's a bit harder to know what and who triggers them so it can be your app which which triggers the the, the functions and uh, in that case your app it's the orchestrator um or and um uh i don't want to uh, do advertising here but uh, if you are going into an uh, uh, Lambda scenario also take a look on these kind of services like the azure logic apps the um, Google Cloud Platform Composer or the AVS step functions. And each of those are basically orchestrators, which can provide some workflows for orchestrating your, your functions. <laughs> and if we're thinking in the context of the uh, integration platform, so the hub uh, and spoke uh, cloud integrations, the same advantages are there for these kind of orchestrations. But still, they have maybe a few more advantages. They are very easy to prototype new functionality. So especially if you're if you're doing something uh, in the cloud and you want, you're having a new project and uh, you want to prototype it, you could do this with functions. The, you, you pay per use. So um, it's almost free until you get to production, of course. And, uh, but then the, the problem would be, hey, I want to reduce my cost because I'm earning a lot of money, but I need to pay uh, the cloud provider also a lot of money, and then you can uh, optimize. But uh, that's, that's the problem. That, that's a, only a problem when you're actually having traffic and earning money and are uh, easy to implement well-defined functionality. Um, now, some of the disappear, uh, disadvantages disappear, right? So their price per usage, not, not that expensive, or one of the, the pricing model, it's per usage. Um, they, they are not necessarily a single point of failure. In generally, the services which you buy are having an SLA. So at least they have availability zones or uh, in, a, in a region, or you can uh, deploy them in multiple regions and so on. But it also requires experienced cloud developers to understand the big picture. So that might be a disadvantage. 
although it's a bit hard right now to do uh, development without a bit of clouds uh, cloud knowledge and uh, using cloud services um, i have a few examples for uh, abs step functions to to show you how they how they look like so basically it's an orchestrator for uh, for your uh, lambdas and abs services and um, this is a very simple example uh, and they are trying to to do the same thing like the integration platforms are doing to give you a way of doing a, a drag and drop workflow with components of uh, what do i want to do and uh, those components some of them are a combination between uh, uh, let's say four loops and uh, and choices but also uh, some integration patterns um, that uh, i spoke a bit uh, earlier so this is a very simple orchestration it's uh, mostly about some small decisions you call an api what to do uh, notify a success or a failure and uh, calling that api can be a lambda function calling call successful it's written somewhere yeah, a bit uh, this one right so this is a choice so is if is the status code 200 then it's a success or not a failure and yeah then then it stops in a more complicated uh, scenario and this is something that we uh, did for uh, for a customer where we need needed to move files from uh, from uh, different locations in s3 to make to analyze them uh, uh, with some uh, uh, glue jobs so um, um, transform them to a uh, queryable format, parquet format, and then uh, make sure that they are indexed and, uh, and saved. Also, track the status. So there are a few steps here, which are uh, custom code. So, for example, the the glue job would be a custom code job. The um, um, get folder this part would be a lambda function um, and yeah, of course update dynamodb that's also something that uh, it's it's uh, a lambda function so uh, having different kind of places where you have uh, lambda functions uh, you could write as i said your own code or a lambda uh, orchestrator which organizes them, or you could use this orchestration. And I mentioned here executions because uh, this is an example on what do you see, for example, when this flow was run and you have an error. So this one is the first error, the, the, the red part. If you click it, you have uh, more details. And in this case, it didn't have uh, permissions to access that uh, S3 location, the, the function to to get the the data from but uh, that's one of the the, the things that uh, it's uh, nice that uh, you can see what were all the executions you can see where did it fail or how did it run so if it runs correctly uh, you could see okay it went through here 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 or uh, here maybe and uh, what were all the steps that were uh, chosen based on some conditions. So every, every time based on an input message, you can see where, where did it went through. So that's what you get out of the box from the platform. For um, logic apps, that's almost the same, but of course it's uh, in, uh, in Azure. You still have a visual designer. You, it integrates great with all the Microsoft uh, product so this is an example of deleting uh, uh, lobs from a from a bucket so it's mostly drag again drag and drop some uh, some components where you can uh, uh, configure write some uh, custom code or uh, set a variable for example here you're calling a function for listing blobs and again being um, Azure Blob Storage, you have a component which can interact easily with uh, Blob Storage and 
some logic about um, and here you're writing your condition or check last modified timestamp and then DDT and it's an action. Oops. <laughs> okay. And um, basically that uh, would be my, my uh, uh, last slide. And these are some, um, uh, let's say, takeaways from the, the, the project and uh, what was more, more difficult in, in all of the projects where we had to do integrations or we used uh, orchestrators uh, in, in cloud. And uh, the, the hardest uh, or part was to the version management, I would say. So changing things and keeping them under control. So that's what one of the things that uh, you cannot uh, live without. Uh, if you are uh, editing them in the uh, tooling there, which uh, you, they are offered in most of the platform, <laughs> make sure that the version management it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, state of the art for those platforms if not use your git basically to 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 version and uh, create your uh, uh, ci cd deployments for uh, deploying the 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 code in in those in those uh, platforms also another uh, takeaway would be the infrastructure versioning so creating those kind of uh, um, uh, logic apps or uh, uh, step functions um, don't copy paste it from uh, an environment to another right so you will have dev test acceptance production whatever environments you have a dtap env uh, environment uh, and then try to uh, version your infrastructure and do it automatically. So use tools like uh, Terraform for uh, creating your infrastructure, deploy your, uh, uh, and configure all the roles needed, all the um, steps needed and, and so on. Because it's very easy to uh, point and click in each, in an integration platform in, a, in a, or in, a, each of these uh, cloud solutions and and uh, have something running, but it's uh, much easier than that to forget some of the steps. Uh, and maybe you had a role which you don't have anymore. So keep everything in the code if possible for, um, for configuring this. And uh, one of the most uh, uh, important things is also logging and monitoring make sure that you are either using the cloud solution or the integration platform features or you're using in your apps a good tool for uh, being able to log monitor trace the calls and uh, i don't know uh, if it's uh, in parallel or it was but uh, i saw that there is a presentation which is uh, uh, discussing also about uh, Spring Cloud and uh, Sleuth, and that's also a component which, if you're doing maybe Java development, add it in your um, in your uh, services, so you know every time which call went where and with what kind of parameters, so that you could have this kind of uh, traceability of uh, uh, of calls. Okay. And thank you, thank you, Mihai. Now we are again, uh, getting to the Q and A part. Thank you for your presentation. And here, Paul will uh, come, yeah, with some applauses for you. Before that, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mihai. So, Paul, we have some questions here. Yes, I did receive some questions, not uh, necessarily in the chat channel, but uh, one of them was, uh, can you automatically end-to-end -end test integrated systems? And if so, how? Uh, I think it depends, it depends, right, <laughs> on uh, on what do you choose, right? But uh, each of the platforms are, are trying to uh, offer you some solutions. So on the uh, uh, top of my head, for example, for MuleSoft, 
you deploy it in an environment, so you deploy your flows in an environment where you can write your end-to-end -end tests and uh, um, um, they will basically call those uh, those flows. For um, sub-CPI, well, I don't know, I didn't do it automatically, I never saw it uh, automatically, but you still have those deployed and you can have an uh, option to test them with some sample data. For um, now, I think end-to-end -end testing can have always an um, an environment where you deploy it, right? So it depends on what's your what's your strategy. So if you're doing, uh, let's say, developer testing, you are going to do it either on your machine or use uh, an environment in the cloud for you. For example, for uh, let's pick ABS uh, functions where you can test them. You emit an event. For uh, you, you define basically how that uh, it's going to be started by an event. In, in general, it's an event. Being an API call, it's still an event, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, you emit an event, and you will uh, see the output in the monitoring and uh, and uh, logging. <laughs> and in in most of our projects, our end-to-end -end tests basically are. Uh, Written written in a, in a language and depending on the choice, right? So it's .NET or Java or uh, even a, um, Node, and we are uh, basically running them uh, on a specific test environment or integration environment. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, the The second question was. Uh, can the monitoring you mentioned uh, catch data integration failures? And uh... I did not go into details, but uh, uh, again, so if we're talking about integration platforms, I think all of those uh, right now have, uh, so from, from what I noticed uh, and used, each of them are advertising their uh, data mapping and data uh, monitoring. Uh, that they have the smarter solution like uh, IntelliSense and so on. So you you are uh, let's say integrate from one data structure to another data structure, and they automatically try to map it. Or if they know it, uh, for example, um, the 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 type of structures or the schemas, they are uh, uh, suggesting you how to match them. And of course, you will see in uh, in that step, if something fails, you will see, hey, the conversion from this field to this field probably failed. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Good to know. Thank you very much, Mihai. Uh, <laughs> you gave us something to think about. Uh, you said you saw nobody using the, the these kinds of platforms yet, but uh, I'm sure that there's going to be more users soon because of you. <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm not trying to. Uh, um advertise any of them as i said the integration platforms and the cloud solutions are for different scenarios just uh, yeah uh, some food for thought uh, between choosing um, do it yourself in in code or finding something off the shelf definitely